happy Tuesday. I thought we would have a little a little coffee talk this morning to chat about classroom management or realistically it's um tea. So a little tea talk to chat about classroom management. I am still going to do my video on my observation because this is my um, planned observation number two for the year. And she's coming in, my principal's coming in on Thursday to observe Hegarty and Phonics. Uh, but today is the pre-observation part, so I'll meet with her and kind of talk about what the expectations are, what we plan to do um, kind of beforehand, and then we'll see how it goes on Thursday. But I remember from last week's video, many of you uh, had said that I was thinking about just doing like a little sit-down video and sharing about classroom management. And many of you said you were interested in that. And I have a lot of papers that I need to put in my student data binder, which is getting larger and larger by the day. So I'm going to do that while we kind of chat a little. Okay, so when I think about classroom management, I kind of think about it in terms of three different sections, right? Um, it's not just like behavior management, there's kind of three parts to it. So when I think of classroom management, what I'm thinking about is number one, student relationships. Um, which is between me and the student, but also between the students and one another. So how I like to set that up and how I try to foster, you know, productive and good relationships between them. Um, number two is routine and structure. And this is the one that I feel like, like there is overall routine and structure, but then also within every lesson, I try to keep it as structured as possible. So there's less time for things to happen type thing. Um, and then the third part is that behavior management. Like what are we doing to um, help with, you know, help produce positive interactions in behavior and help diminish negative ones. So there's kind of three parts and I'll go into all three is my plan. Now I do also wanna to say too, before I kind of dive in here, like big disclaimer, that classroom management is highly personal. So I'm going to share what routines and structures and things I have in place, but if it's not something that you either A, want to do or B, think you'll keep up with, then it's not going to work for you, right? Like there are some things that are research-based and I think you should try, like um, that I'll go over in the video, but also it has to be something you keep up with, you buy into, because otherwise it's just not going to work. And I do believe that there are many different ways that teachers can be successful with classroom management. So you do absolutely do not need to do my way. Again, that is, I, I try to emphasize this, but on my channel, I just like to share what I'm doing um, based on what I've learned in the past and what's successful for me. And if you wanna take bits and pieces of it, feel free. If you hate all of this, feel free, that's totally fine. But let's dive in and you can kind of hear what I do. All right, the first part is student relationships. And again, that's not just with me, that's also with, you know, uh, with each other, which is going to be a very important part of like kind of building your classroom culture, which will help with classroom management. And it's funny because like, you know, building relationship with students is like part of all those like funny teacher TikToks and teacher memes like, oh, my classroom's, you know, on fire right now. And, every, and the principal is just like, yeah, but did you build relationships with them? And it is very funny because that's, you know, not helpful um, advice at that time. But it is, you know, they, the reason that people say it is because it's true. If you build relationships with your students, you get to know them better, you understand kind of what makes them tick, what they are willing to work for and all that stuff. That's not something I super emphasize. Um, of course, I build relationships with my students or with them every single day for hours and hours. So naturally, um, I am, you know, wondering what they're up to, who's in their family, what do they like to do on the weekends? Those are things we do talk about and that I do think are important. But I also think it's equally important to have students build relationships with one another. So just some things that I do every single day to kind of help that kind of go along is number one, I've already talked about the importance of our morning meeting. I think our morning meeting sets the tone for our day every single day in our classroom. Um, I've talked about this before. Here's my video where I kind of go over what we do every single day. And so not only are we doing that relationship building every day, but we're saying good morning to one another. We're taking those calming deep breaths. We're getting to know about one another and interacting with our peers. But also, you know, part two of classroom management is it's that routine and structure every single day. Students know what to expect. So that's kind of a two in one with my morning meeting. It's again, my favorite part of the day. I know not everybody does a morning meeting. I know people feel like they don't have time for it. It is something I make time for, even if it has to pull five minutes from somewhere else. It's just 
that's how strongly I feel about it, again, for my classroom. Another big part of our classroom is we use partner work or group work a lot. Uh, specifically partner work this year, I did find I used a lot more group work. Um, right now I have three sets of six tables or six desks together. So I'm used to having four in a group um, where I was able to do a little bit more group work. But now with the six, I do a lot of partnership work. And not only do we do a lot of partnership work, but we also talk about what that partnership work should look like. So every time we learn a new partner game, we are not only talking about how to actually play the game, but we're talking about how to play it with our partner. So at the end of every game, at the end of every little discussion we have with our partners, we are saying, thank you for sharing with me. We're saying, thank you for playing with me. We're giving each other a high five. We are making sure we say that person's name and make sure we know that person's name. This is like towards the beginning of the year, but even still, um, some students need help, like remembering a person's name very quickly. So we're making sure we know their name before we play the game. Just little things like that where students are getting comfortable with one another and they are seeing exactly how to interact. So on my end, what that means is when I'm modeling this game, I will call all students over to the rug. I will have them sit in a circle. I will show them exactly how to play whatever game it is. And then I will also explain like, oh, and if I get a skip turn, how am I going to react if I get a skip turn? How am I going to react if my partner gets a skip turn? What does that look like? What does that sound like? If I lose the game, am I gonna pout and scream? Even if it's upsetting, of course it's upsetting to lose. We want to win, but am I gonna pout and be like a sore loser? If I win the game, am I going to brag and make my partner feel bad about it? So part of that, um, modeling is again not just playing the game but how to play with one another and then I already said this but every time we have a structured like chat with a partner every time we have a start a structured play game with a partner we always thank that partner for sharing with us or playing with us and we give a little high five a fist bump or something like that and kind of the last part for student relationships is that I like to change their partnerships often um, so every single month I said we have three groups of six in here let me just show you so you can see. I know you've seen my classroom before, but that way you can see it. The view from the back of the room. So here you can see I have, you know, three groups of six set up. And so every single month I massively change up these groups. And I do do it, you know, based on some behaviors like who should sit next to each other and who should not. But I also largely try to do this based on who has not worked with one another yet and who could use a little more work working together. And I think it's important to note, I told parents this at Open House too, that I very, very rarely will change somebody's seat um, earlier than the month that they are kind of together. If I pair students together and they are not working together well, that's a sign that they need to learn how to work together well. So just because they're not working together or maybe they're chatting too much or whatever, um, I really try not to move them. There are special circumstances, and of course I will, if like the safety of that student or the well-being of that student um, is not well, of course I will move seats, but that happens pretty rarely. I really instead try to focus on trying to work through that um, with students and you know, trying to come up with solutions in ways that they can work together. Also naturally within classrooms, students are going to gravitate towards one another. Maybe they had friends from last year that they know or really, you know, formed a close bond or relationship with somebody in the classroom that if I allowed them to just pair up on their own all the time, um, they would pick that same person. So I purposely like to switch that up and make sure students are interacting with everybody in the classroom at some point in time. So yeah, every single month. So this, yesterday was Monday. So yesterday, I just rearranged the whole classroom and we have our whole new groups for December. Now, in case you were wondering about partnerships during games, um, I have right now, I just pair students based on ability and not like highest and lowest, like those would never be paired together. Instead, I cut it in the middle and then, you know, my lowest student in math, and this is gonna be different in math and literacy, right? So my lowest student in math would be paired with somebody in the middle um, in math and then kind of going up like that. So that way there's not too big of a gap. So that's how I pair students during those types of games. So they have somebody that they're playing with during math, somebody that they're playing with during literacy. They have their table partners where they're next to each other doing things. Um, on Fridays, I let them pick a partner. So again, throughout the week, they are working with maybe four or five different partners, um, which is great. And that changes all the time, right? So in math and in literacy, those partners, as we learn new skills, those also change. They don't stay the same. Um, sometimes they do, but they usually change. I moved over so I could um, 
keep filling this up. But so step one, of course, is really just focusing on those classroom interactions and classroom relationships, both with you and your students, but also with your students and one another. So everything I just said, making sure students are working together, but showing them how to work together. What does that look like? What does it not look like? And so on. Those clear, clear expectations. Part two is routine and structure. And this is kind of, I feel like where I um, thrive. And that's because I am a very routine person myself for better or for worse. <laughs> so you definitely have to be, you know, flexible from time to time, but I am a very structured person. And what I mean by structure and routine is not just like your daily schedule and how you follow um, each of the subject periods. Of course, we know our students need that type of structure. And when they are having what we call a ziggle zaggle day or a ziggle zaggle period where something might be different, we definitely want to alert them and let them know about that. But on top of just the classroom structure and having that, you know, run like a well-oiled machine, what I find actually helps most of all for any behavior management, classroom management type thing is having a well-paced and well-structured lesson. So each lesson throughout the day, I spend a lot of time thinking about and planning out, making sure we're following that gradual release model, really thinking about how long are we sitting on the rug. Um, if my students can't handle the rug for a long time, I don't let them get to that point of frustration. I have them sit there, and of course we can slowly extend that and build it up, but why would I set them up for failure, right? I wanna set them up for success. So if my students are having trouble sitting on the rug for three minutes, we sit on the rug for two and a half minutes. Then we stand up, maybe we'll talk and do a stand up, hand up, pair up. Then we can come back to the rug and continue. Um, so also just having that part put in there is really, really crucial to my classroom management. Also just naturally when you have that routine in place that cuts down on the transition time, which are those unstructured periods where you know all H-E double hockey sticks can break loose, right? So even just knowing what to do makes things go a lot faster and smoother. All right, for part three, I wanted to move on over to my desk. I finished sorting all those papers into my data binder. So I wanted to sit in my cozy chair. Um, part three is our last part. This is the part that I feel like most people think of when they say classroom management, and that is the behavior management piece. Um, but realistically, if you get those student relationships and that routine and structure in place, it does a lot of the kind of heavy lifting for you, right? It does a lot of the work for you. So with behavior management, I don't use, and I've said this numerous times, I think that's why people started asking um, for me to explain more, but I don't use any sort of token system or any sort of reward system. And we have a heavy, heavy emphasis on intrinsic versus extrinsic motivation. And again, I know I've said this before, but I want my students to be kind to their partner because they should be kind to their partner, not because they want to earn a sticker or they want to get a pom-pom in a jar or whatever it ends up being, right? I want them to understand why they should be kind to their partner and that if they're not kind to their partner, people aren't really going to want to be friends with them. That whole part there is that lo those logical consequences. I really want my students to understand why I'm asking them to do these things or why they think they should do these things. Now, I should definitely be clear. I am not a, you know, naysayer of token systems and all things like that. Um, again, find what works for you. I have found for myself in the past that students, they get kind of lackluster, right? The students that I want to be able to do what they're doing and earn those, they earn the stickers all the time. They do it anyway. Um, so yes, they are getting a positive reward. I understand that. But for the students that I'm trying to use it for, it's not really working, if you know what I mean. Um, or it works for a little bit and then they kind of get sick of it. That has just been my experience. And I was, I didn't like, I felt like I didn't like what it was teaching them. Um, again, to kind of work for that sticker. Uh, now, again, that could be a me problem in the way I worded it and the way I was trying to get it set up. Maybe I was doing too much of an emphasis on those rewards that they were getting. So that's something to think about. But I have really steered clear from them. Now, I have said this before, every once in a while, I will absolutely um, do like a fun little thing. Like, so during springtime, sometimes around wintertime, when our class needs a little boost, I like to do a whole class reward where I might say like, oh, you know what? We have really been trying to work on not interrupting others. Let's see if we can do like an interrupting challenge, right? And it's something that I want my students to work on and see if we can not blurt out or not interrupt, then maybe we will, again, do one of those token systems. I don't think there's anything horribly wrong with it. I said all the time when I was a substitute, I was known for giving taps. And if you got a tap, that means you earned a sticker by the end of the day. Now there's a couple things I will point out about this. And I always said this during taps, 
Um, when I would do that reward system, which was an external motivation, right? I was a sub, I didn't know them. I wanted to get that behavior going and get through the day. I would never not give a student a sticker. And what that means, and this is something that one of my vice principals over a decade ago told me, is every single student, even the student that is struggling the most, who might be you know, interrupting all the time, every single student throughout the day is doing something correctly, right? There's not one child in your room who is just all day long doing the opposite of what they're supposed to do. It's your job as the teacher to find them when they're doing that right thing and give that positive reinforcement. So I was always able to give a student a tap, even the students that were, you know, calling out or not standing in line appropriately and so on. And what I found is when they got that tap, they felt so good about themselves that they wanted to continue getting that positive reinforcement, right? That's positive reinforcement 101. Um, but I just think that's important to note too, that if I do a whole group type of reward system. I will make sure every student in the class in some way has uh, participated or joined in on getting us that reward system. So I might say we need like 17, 17 circles or something. I won't say that way in case we're waiting for like one more person. They're like, oh, we're waiting for you. Come on. Um, but I will make sure that every single person has contributed. So essentially, sometimes in my classroom, it feels like, oh, we don't have like any classroom management. If someone was like, oh, what's your or what's your behavior management? I just it's just positive reinforcement. Like truthfully, it's positive reinforcement and it is logical consequences. Now, you can look up online all sorts of great logical consequences for you to explain to your students because they should be very aware of what they are. I always the first example I always think of because it's just so easy is like if you're not using scissors appropriately, you don't get to have scissors. Um, if you break something in the classroom, you need to fix it. And we always say that includes feelings. If you hurt somebody's feelings, you need to fix it and apologize. And you always are going to say what you're going to do next time better, right? Um, the hard part for the teacher, and again, there's like tons of them and you can go over them with your students. I do this when I'm saying, what does this look like? What does this not look like? So if I'm teaching them at the beginning of the year how to use glue, a glue stick, and they are, you know, you, what does it look like? Show me appropriate glue stick. What would it not look like? Oh, rolling it all the way up, putting, we don't actually do this, but giving examples, like putting glue on the wall. What would happen if we were doing that? What's the logical consequence here? The consequence is you don't get to participate in that project, and you can try again and show me when you know how to do it. Um, that word show me is also something I say all the time. I find that that's really important to help with self-regulation because instead of just saying, uh, nope, walk in line properly or something, or nope, get in your rug spot and sit and be quiet or whatever you want them to do, I just ask them, so-and-so, can you show me how we sit on the rug? Because this makes them do it. They need to show me how they do it. And it lets me know that I fully understand that they know how to do it. Because sometimes, especially towards the beginning of the year, I'm like, oh, maybe I need to do a better job of more explicitly stating my expectations of how I want them to sit on the rug. That comes out of my mouth all the time. I'm like, oh, can you show me how we stand in line? Oh, can you show me how we sit on the rug? Oh, can you show me how we use that pencil? <laughs> That's like all day long. Um, but it's, it's on purpose. I do that on purpose. And then, of course, the positive reinforcement. And what I'm working on is getting better at being more specific at that. I did say this in one of my other videos. Um, when my principal was observing me, she writes down everything, like everything I say, it's like scripted. And the amount of times I say good job or great job or something along those lines is tremendous. It's a lot. Um, but only like half the time was I saying something specific. So in the hallway, when students are, you know, out of line or not doing what they're supposed to do, I look for someone who is doing what they're supposed to. And I'll use my kid's name. So great job, Calvin. I love the way you are standing in line with your eyes forward and your mouth closed. And then of course, you know, you see everybody else just like, oh, get in line, mouth closed. And again, for those students who may struggle with that, the second they do it, give them that praise right away. The second they do, look for it. You can even say, oh, I'm looking for so-and-so to show me how, can, how they can do that. Wow, great job, what a rock star, whatever you wanna say, all that positive praise. So realistically, positive reinforcement and logical consequences are like the backbones of my behavior management in my classroom. There are definitely circumstances where a behavior might be so extreme that you do a token board for that student in particular, right? Or you do whatever's going to work for that student. But these are my whole group type of management. And that has worked in my seven years of a class, as being a classroom teacher, that has worked the best for me. I have definitely tried other things. I think I told you years ago, I did have 
the dreaded clip chart, which I hate that I did it. I was so influenced by um, teacher blogs. Everybody was doing it. And so I put it up and I did not like it like immediately. First of all, I would forget to move people's names and it felt only punitive. It felt like I was only moving somebody to yellow if they were doing something wrong. So that barely lasted a year. Um, but I've tried all sorts of things. I've tried lots of token systems, all the fun ones that they have. And again, they are very fun. So I like to add them in, but that's not the main way we focus on that behavior. So all that to say, that is kind of how I use classroom management in my classroom, really focusing on student relationships within uh, myself and that student and with each other, really honing in on the structure and routine. And then that behavior management part is really heavily focused on positive reinforcement and logical consequences. So that's kind of where we're at. I will say it's not easy. It's not for the faint of heart. I know it kind of sounds like it's, it's simple, right? Like the idea is simple, but it's really not easy. Uh, to constantly say all these things. The other thing with the logical consequences, and this is something you know I think everybody has to work on, uh, self included, is that you don't want to be judgmental or like kind of punitive about the consequence. You want to try to be as like neutral as you can. It's just like, oh, you did this, so this. You did this, so this. And it's not like you did this. I'm taking this away. You're never going to get it again. Cause kids can read that energy. And with a lot of students that makes them even more like combative. Um, that makes them feel like you don't like them. That makes them feel all these things. Right. When instead it's just like, Nope, kind of black and white. You did this. So this happens and trying to tone down that sort of judgment or whatever is probably one of the hardest parts, especially if you are feeling really frustrated. Again, that's something I really try to work on. Um, and have worked on for a lot. So I don't know if this answered any questions for you. I don't know if it made you think of more questions. I'm not sure, but I do hope you thought this video was helpful. I feel like I just kind of sat here and, and ranted. Um, this is, I should have said this when I dropped this coffee off. This is the end of the day now. I did the other parts earlier and now um, it's the end of the day. Life got busy, here we are. So I'm having a coffee at the end of the day and have a little coffee talk with you. If you have any specific questions, go ahead and drop them down below. I do feel like this was kind of just a uh, ramble of me sitting here drinking coffee and just telling you my thoughts. Um, so I hope it was helpful. If it was, please give it a thumbs up so I know. If you have other behavior management, classroom management techniques and tools that work with you, please drop them down below in the comments. I feel like teachers can use all the help they can get, um, self-included, so please, drop down what works for you. Again, classroom management is a totally a personal thing and what works for me not, might not work for you and what works for you might not work for me. So drop all the ideas down so we can try them out. Be sure you're subscribed to my video and click that bell. That way you're notified of every new video. See you in the next one. Bye.